Hello and welcome to our, our webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm, my name is Preston Walker. And I'm James Ball and we're from Oak House Kitchen over here in the UK. And we're going to spend our time on this webinar looking to dispel some myths around making uh, the foods up for the various idzi food levels. We're going to look at various things throughout the webinar. Uh, three main uh, subjects we're going to concentrate on. The first one is starchy foods and how we can make really nice uh, purees for the idzi level four. We're also going to be looking at meats and in particular how we can get nice tender soft cuts of meat through different cooking processes and how best to approach that for a Nidzi level 5. And then finally we're going to look at vegetables and how to ensure softness for a Nidzi level 6. At the end of the webinar we're going to have a final little module where we're going to bring all the elements from the uh, three segments together on one plate to create our signature dish. Lovely. So first of all, we're going to have a look at uh, these particular idzi level uh, foods um, so that we know where we're coming to when we get to those particular points later on in the, in the webinar. Uh, so first of all, Preston, you're going to look at a, an idzi level 4 puree. So for all of these purees, we've looked at, we've got some carrots here which we've modified into the different consistencies. Uh, for the idzi level 4 puree, you can see that the, the puree itself sits in a mound above the fork. We can have a slight tail coming down below the prongs of a dinner fork but what you can see is it's not dripping constantly. You can also see that the prongs of a dinner fork have laid, laid a, made a, a clear pattern or indent in the top. Um, and also just to highlight the stickiness of foods we've got the spoon tilt test um, and how we perform that we take a sample of the carrot puree placing it onto the spoon then we're just going to turn the spoon over um, and also give it a slight flick just to dislodge the food sample like this. And you should see that the sample slips off, dollops off in one go and leaves minimal residue. You can see as well there's no particles, just the visual appearance, there's no particles. We've actually passed it through a sieve to, to ensure that it is completely smooth. So that's the carrot puree for an idzi level 4. Lovely. Uh, we're now going to have a look at the idzi level 5 minced and moist um, uh, and what you have here is now by just moving this around in here you can see that there's now lumps within this particular texture within this level. Uh, the lumps that are in here we'll have a check in a moment as to the size of them but for an adult they should be no bigger than, uh, than four mil by four mil and as you can see it mounds on the fork uh, but there's no thin fluid no thin liquid coming through there so it's cohesive in that way. The other test that we did with the level four, the spoon tilt test, we'll do with this too. So I'm just going to pick it up again, it mounds on the spoon, and if I flick it, it comes off in one go, leaving minimal residue there, as you can see on that spoon. So they were the two tests around that. We're going to test now the size of the particles, or the lumps within this, and the, and the softness of them. So if I spread them out here, you can see that if I put my fork prongs over them that they fit well within the prongs of a fork and to test the softness I'm just going to take my fork use the back of the fork and as I push down very gently it will squidge down without any whitening of my thumbnail there as you can see so it's soft enough to be used for this level so that there are the four tests for idzi level 5 minced and moist Right, so the first section we're going to look at um, in terms of the foods themselves is going to be on meat. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at with the meat is the fact that we're going to try and get it to an idzi level 5 minced and moist. Now there are plenty of different cuts of meat across different types of animal um, out there um, and sometimes those, those, those cuts of meat are very difficult to actually get soft enough to do what we were doing with the fork pressure test. Um, so initially we're just going to have a quick uh, look at the animals themselves and the types of muscles that are used and what that then means from us or for us uh, in a cooking sense. Um, so the, the first thing that we're going to look at really is, uh, is a chicken. Now we've, in terms of chicken meat we have the breast which is white, 
uh, white meat and we have the legs and the thigh which is the brown meat in a very easy way of, of describing what muscles do and, and how they then perform the, the, the breast meat is, is white and is very tender uh, and when it's cooked it's very tender up to a point when it then will go dry um, it also hasn't got a great deal of flavor where we look at the legs and the thigh we now have the most flavorful of meat but we also have a very unctuous meat and a cut that when it's cooked slowly or cooked for longer it breaks down um, and becomes very tender um, essentially we're looking at the usage of that muscle the muscles around the breast are used for flapping the wings and are used very rarely and for short periods of time whereas our leg and thighs in a, in a chicken they're walking around on the farmyard all the time and they're and they're being used so that's why we and that's the kind of thinking we need when we order our meat for this type of uh, cookery so if we have a look at at our cow here and we have a, a sheep as well but essentially they're the same for animals that are on four legs we now have certain parts of the animal which are used regularly which we want to really buy and use for this purpose we have uh, the four legs or the shanks as they're called in some parts of the world uh, we have uh, the neck here as well the cheeks are well used because cows essentially eat all day the tails are flipping around so oxtail is a, is a meat that is, is, is very soft once it's been cooked for a long period of time um, on the sheep again we have the shanks and the foreleg we have the neck and again uh, we have um, those well used muscles that are the cheeks as well that are, that are, that are useful for this particular type of, of, of selection of meat so we want to stay away just to recap we want to stay away from the meats that are tender so that's the fillets and the steaks and the things you'd cook very quickly and we want to move on to cooking processes of those tougher meats which we can then find a, a particularly soft texture which would be suitable for idzi level five and for six as well but okay so we've just got a couple of um, cuts of beef here that we wanted to to show you so we've got two different cuts we've got this one here which is um, a beef blade so this is from the, the shoulder of the animal um, it has a nice layer of, of, of sinew through the centre, which when it cooks down, it, it becomes very jelly-like. Um, we've also got a shin of beef here, obviously from the leg of the animal, it's worked really well. And you can see the dark meat, you can see the fibres there as well. But during the cooking method, the ch cooking process, this will all break down and be add great flavour. Um, the other thing I like about these cuts, they're, they're generally cheaper cuts. Um, and because of where they are, they're well, well used, you can get great flavour into the dish. Now, I wanted to show you just you know, purely from a, a chef's point of view when we, when we look at preparing meat. Um, so I've just taken a few slices off here and you can see I wanted to show you the, the, the fibres. So the fibres on a piece of meat like this are running the length of the meat. Now, purely to make this more tender, if I was slicing this cooked, I would slice across the, gra across the grain, which means that when I bite into it, I'm biting down in between the muscle fibers, which is going to make it more tender in the mouth. Um, the same on this, you can see this is a great way, a great example, you can see all these muscle fibers, they're running the length of the muscle there. So again, what I would do, I would slice it down across those muscle fibers, so when we're eating it, it is more naturally more tender in the mouth. Um, a few key things I think um, when we are looking at meat and also when, when we're modifying foods, I think particularly um, flavour is sometimes compromised depending on what ingredients we are, we are blending down or we are modifying. Uh, for many ingredients, a lot of liquid would need to be added, which obviously will dilute that flavour. So really being mindful of, of trying to develop layers of flavour during the cooking process. So I, uh, I approach this as I would do any other uh, um, braised beef dish. What, I, what we've done, we've, we've sealed uh, these off in a pan initially to get some great colour and some great flavour on there. We've then transferred it into a casserole dish and we've cooked it in the oven for a long period of time at a low temperature um, and we've cooked it with a lid on to try and make sure the uh, um, it's as consistent as possible and we're getting as minimal evaporation uh, from the liquid during the cooking process as possible. I'm just going to get rid of this raw meat and we can have a look at the cook processes now. So we've got our, our blade of beef.
and we've got our shin of beef. And to talk you through what we've done to get to this stage, we brown this off in a pan, we've added to a casserole dish, we've cooked it um, uh, in some stock, we've had some vegetables in there, we cooked it in a low temperature, a low temperature oven about 150 degrees for three to four hours. Um, and all that fat's gonna break down, all the collagen's gonna break down, and we're gonna get a lovely, set, uh, lovely tender, soft piece of meat like this. You can see, I was saying, um, the gelatinous um, part, the center there of the, the blade is all broken down, is really, really nice and soft. So what I'm just gonna do is just take a couple of slices off there. just to show you with a fork how tender this can be. There you go. Thank you. I mean, obviously the particle size hasn't been cut down to the appropriate size yet, but this is really just to show you how simple it is to cook something like this and to get some really nice soft texture. It's just really breaking and falling apart. Very, very tender. So in terms of cooking methods, there's many different cooking methods and really what we want to do is keep as much moisture in there um, as possible. So we, we are favouring the cooking methods that, that maintain as much moisture as possible. So things like pot roasting or braising, casseroles and stews. What we don't want to be doing is roasting. Um, roasting obviously is a great way of, of adding flavour but it does dry foods out as it cooks. which does um, have a few challenges when it comes to the modifying process. Uh, so we always tend to cook things uh, with a lid on top to keep that moisture temperature, uh, moisture content up to make sure things are, are steamed and, uh, and nice and soft at the end of the cooking process. Okay, so while we're on meat, we're just gonna have a quick look at fish and just discuss the fish in the context of the same thing. It is, it is, it is the same in that, uh, that Fish itself is very, very delicate and doesn't take a great deal of cooking in order to break down those, those proteins and the, the muscle fibers in fish. So we're talking about, again, like braising, but poaching uh, is a very good method in, in order to get it as soft as possible throughout. Fish is a very delicate meat. Generally, there are some sort of firmer cuts like monkfish, etc. cetera, um, but ultimately they require less cooking, less temperature as well, otherwise they can, they can overcook very quickly and become very dry. And exactly the same as what Preston was saying earlier, you know, that moistness, with, moistness within that, uh, that meat is important to help with its ability to move around in the, in the mouth and be easy to, to swallow. Um, overall, you just need to make sure that it's cooked lower. Poaching methods are good, Frying again, we'll, we'll seize it up and we'll, we'll dry it out. Uh, and obviously we need to make sure there's no skins involved there as well. So we, we only take the fillet. Finally, just make sure that all the bones are taken out because they're very inappropriate. And we can do that at the point, at the point where we're actually processing it and cutting it into the pieces that we need. Um, overall, and this applies to both meat and fish, we're looking at the gelatin content that's within the meat and the, and, and the fish, because it can be quite high, and that means that oh, as, as something cools on the plate, it can start to firm up and change texture. So you just need to be aware of, of service temperatures, using plates that are warm, how long the food might be sitting there, in order to maintain the, the delicate soft texture that we need. So the next section uh, is going to be on modifying starches or carbohydrates that are starchy uh, in order to make uh, IDSI level four pureed uh, meals and, and foods. Uh, just a, a quick um, overview of starches in total uh, to start with, just because they apply across um, the whole spectrum of different starches that are out there. I mean, starches are uh, carbohydrate and starchy foods are, are well eaten across the globe. You know, we've got rice here we're going to look at, we've got potatoes we're going to look at, we've got noodles and pasta that we're looking at, etc. They are a staple food across the globe and we need to know therefore how to process them correctly or certainly what the best ways of dealing with them are. Um, very, very quickly, there are, within starchy foods, there are two molecules. There's amylose and amylopectin. Amylose is reasonably flat, or, or linear in its, in its shape, and amylopectin is branched heavily. Um, and 
the characteristics of those particular uh, uh, carbohydrate molecules really dictate how they're going to act and work in the mouth and, and how, you, how, how you experience them when you eat them. Um, if we take rice as an example, we know we have here a short grain rice and a long grain rice. Um, if you take your long gra grain rices, they're the kinds of rices you cook uh, and when, they are, when they're cooked, um, they, they, they have single rice particles, they're nice and fluffy and easy to eat, easy to break down uh, and separate. At the other end you've got your, uh, your, your short grain rice, which at the real sticky end we have something called sticky rice. Uh, we call it sticky rice because as it cooks, it breaks down and the, the, the rice particles, the rice, the, they, they stick together. And when you put them in your mouth, it tastes very sticky. Essentially, the long grain rice are made up of the linear amylose and the short grain rice are made up of the amylopectin, the branched one. And that means it breaks down easily because it doesn't fit together well. It goes into the water and as it cooks, it binds those particles together. So that's essentially the difference between those two molecules and we find those across the potatoes and wheat and, and, and other starches. What we found when we're looking at the rice though is although that when we describe it as, as a rice in its own right, the amylopectin, the short grain rice, the one high in amylopectin, is sticky. If we blend it down in order to produce a level four, an idzi level four, actually it doesn't bind well or as well as the amylose the, the, in, the, in the long grain rice and therefore is less sticky. So our, our, our basic understanding of if you're going to take a rice and have to modify it in order to become a puree or idzi level four, then the best type of rice to take would be a short grain variety. I'm going to highlight this just by looking at some different recipes that we've put together using long grain rice and short grain rice. So over here we have a long grain rice recipe and a short grain ri rice recipe using equal quantities of rice and liquid. And if we take our long grain rice, you can see that there, it flows off and is particularly sticky as we would expect because it can bind easily. And if we take our short grain rice version, exactly the same quantities, it is less cohesive and therefore moves around a lot easier. Yeah, you see that. But those aren't or wouldn't be appropriate for that easy level four, they'd be too thin. So we've changed the recipe and just modified it a little bit just to see. And now we've got 150 grams of long grain or short grain rice mixed with 750 grams of fluid or of liquid. And as you can see here, as you would expect, or oh, this one here is the long grain rice, and we know that that would be stickier because it can bind well, and of exactly the same quantities of rice and fluid, this one, the, the short grain rice, is still mobile and still moves around, although as you can see it's still particularly sticky. Okay, so that highlights, I think, quite clearly that if we have long grain rice, we're gonna have something that's firmer and stickier and more cohesive. And if we use short grain rice, we'll have something that is gonna be more appropriate. That aside, I think one thing that we've learned with the recipes that we've done is that ultimately the rice within the dish needs to be mixed with other things in order to get them to be tasty and to be delicious. Essentially, when we're cooking rice normally, for a normal diet, we're, we're going to mix it with a sauce. It picks up sauce as well, risottos and curries and chicken fricassees, those types of things. They, they seep into the rice and, and, and the sauce makes the rice delicious. So we'll show you a little later on when we get onto the, our signature dish, how you can incorporate the rice, the carbohydrate element of the meal, in with other purees and other ingredients in order to make them as delicious as possible. Okay, so we're going to have a little look at uh, <coughs> potatoes. And very similar to, to rice, there's many, many different varieties of potato. Um, you know, we, we've got uh, some Maris Piper potatoes here, which are, are quite mealy and quite flowery in nature. Um, and then we've got, you know, a salad potato, which is actually quite, uh, quite waxy. Um, so really we, we've, we found from some of the testing that you know, the flowery mealy potato would be the potato of choice in terms of mashed potato. Um, one thing that we, we did want to highlight is the fact that 
you know, there's many different consistencies of mashed potato. Um, if you think of uh, French restaurants with, you know, pom puree, a really kind of thick, uh, luxurious um, consistency with lots of cream, uh, lots of butter being folded through that. But in reality, it can actually create quite a sticky texture. Um, and really, we, what we're trying to highlight, there's many different recipes that you can use. And to show you some of the different inconsistencies here, this is a, a, a mashed potato that we've made with, with heavy cream and, heavy, and, and butter in there as well. It's quite a firm consistency. Whereas this one that we've got here, it's a lot looser in texture and flows a lot better. Now, when we come to preparing our potatoes, it's really quite important that we try and keep things as consistent as possible. So when we are, when we're slicing up potatoes, got a knife for you. Yeah. Yeah. When, we're, when we're slicing up potatoes, rather than cutting them in a traditional way, we would peel these down and then we would cut them into chunks, put them in a pan to boil with water. If you, if you look at this, um, it's actually you know, quite uneven shapes. And what you're going to find is the ends, the thinner ends here are going to overcook quite quickly and potentially leave a, a, a hard piece in the centre that's not quite cooked. So in, in terms of cooking the potato, what we've done, we've actually cut this into slices. Um, what, we're going to actually, what we're going to have here now, when it cooks, it's going to be a lot more even. These slices of potato can either be boiled or steamed in about 15 minutes. It's really important with potato, as soon as it's ready, that we do um, spend the time to, to, to make it into mashed potato as soon as possible. Because if we let it sit in the water, it's going to absorb any extra uh, water, which is going to affect the final consistency of the mash. Um, also, as well, if we allow it to go cold or overwork the potato during the mashing process, it's, it's going to become gluey and sticky, uh, and really an unpleasant mouth texture uh, that wouldn't be suitable. So in terms of a, a recipe for mashed potato, what we've um, actually got here is some mash that we've cooked by our potato slices. We've passed this potato through a sieve. So we, all we've got here is a puree potato with nothing else in it at all. Um, to that, we're going to add um, 50 grams of milk and 10 millilitres of rapeseed oil. There's 100 grams of potato here, and we found that recipe is pretty consistent. Um, the reason I'm using oil instead of butter, with butter, butter being a saturated fat, when it cools down, it solidifies and gets a lot firmer. So if you had um, a person that took uh, a long time to eat their meal, you're gonna get um, less of a, a consistency or a texture difference in this as it cools. It stays a consistent te texture for a longer period of time and it tastes very good. So now, and finally, we're going to look at some, uh, some noodles and, and pasta, which are made up of wheat uh, and, and made up and cooked off. And we've had a few findings here in terms of looking at the quantities of, of, of liquid and fluid that we add into these to make them work. So we've got here our pasta, and very similar to the rice, what we've done with it, we overcooked this to start with. Um, just really important that you're making sure, particularly with starches, they are cooked through enough, they're well cooked, um, because if not, they are going to end up um, uh, creating a firmer texture than you, you set out to. So um, we've cooked this for about 20 minutes. Normally with pasta, we can cook it in about 10 to 12 minutes, but just by overcooking it, just ensures it's really, really soft and helps out with the modifying process. Um, Thinking about pasta, uh, what we've done, we've come up with two different recipes for you here. Uh, we've come up with a tomato pasta and also a cheese pasta too. So we've used brown and white um, pasta with this. Uh, the recipes that we've got for it, so for the uh, tomato pasta, we've used 100 grams of pasta. We've blended this down with 100 millilitres of vegetable stock and then we've also added 100 grams of passata. And you can see here the consistency for the white pasta is, is, is pretty good. Yeah. For a smooth puree, it's sitting on the fork quite well. It's a nice smooth consistency. It's not sticky in texture. So really happy with that one. Similarly for the brown, there really isn't much texture difference between the white and the brown varieties. 
slight difference, um, but that will be down to the anima pectin, that's, as we saw in the right. The rice, the brown is slightly more fluid than the white pasta, but that is what we would expect. Um, moving on for the, the cheese sauce. So the cheese sauce, I've actually got 100 grams of pasta and I blended that down with 120 millilitres of milk. And then we've also added some cheese to that. So we've got 10 grams of um, a Parmesan cheese or a hard cheese. I, I prefer using a hard cheese because they are more powerful in strength uh, and then you don't get any, it's not adding bulk to the recipe, it's just adding flavour really. Does need a little bit more thickened up this one for an idzi level four. So you would just add less fluid then? We just, you could add just a little so. bit less fluid to that if it needs to be. I think really the, the overarching learning that we found with this is that many carbohydrates will need or will the texture will be improved by the addition of other, other ingredients, which I think um, works quite well because if you think of pasta and rice dishes uh, across the globe in different cultures, these types of foods are generally served with something quite, uh, quite wet, quite moist, so it's going to absorb the, all that flavour. Um, and certainly with this, blending the pasta down with, um, with the milk and the cheese and the tomato, you know, you're diluting that stickiness and you're getting something that's much more enjoyable and safer for um, an Idzi level four. So the next uh, section that we're going to look at is uh, we're going to take vegetables and look at some of the things to look for in the vegetables that you're going to use. And then also we're going to look at some of the, the cooking methods that you can use for vegetables, which will, will help to soften, will, will help to keep nutrition and those types of things that you should be thinking about within making up your Izzy level six soft and bite size. Um, so in front of me I've got a range of vegetables, there's clearly not all of the vegetables around, but they do highlight some of the things that you may come across in, in selecting the vegetables that you've got. The fresher the vegetables really the better because they, they tend to be more succulent and more able to, to cook down quickly and they also have packed with more nutrition um, than the ones that have been sitting in a warehouse for, for a long time. Um, but basically here we've got uh, some things which we can highlight. Uh, some problems you may encumber, encounter. Peppers, for example, these have got skins on them and they also, within the pepper, have seeds too, although I've cut through, there's some seeds there, you can really see them. Um, these are unable to be cooked down until they're completely soft. So if you were going to uh, be cooking these for an Idzi level six, soft and bite size, would need to be removed totally uh, from, that, uh, from that vegetable. Um, in order to make them soft enough and, and able to pass the texture tests. Um, butternut squash as well has the skin and also has seeds within it, which you would need to take out and make sure weren't around uh, when you were cooking those down. Um, other than that, that is a very soft textured flesh, which can be made and cooked out in a range of different ways so that it's soft enough to be an Italy level six. Um, peas. Peas, although they are of a small size, they're, they're surrounded with the skin, which is impossible to get rid of, um, however you would do it. Uh, you're not going to sit there and peel the peas. Ultimately, there is, there is only one way to, do, to use peas within, within a modified diet, and that is to, to blend them down until they're very, very fine as a, as a thick puree. Uh, so, so just in, in things like sweet corn also have that particular um, fact to them. Parsnips. As with carrots and other uh, root vegetables, they can have, I'll just have a look in here. They have a very fibrous middle to them, which can sometimes be very, very difficult to, be, to make soft enough to pass Idzi level six. Um, so we've, when we've cooked these, we've made sure that we've cut that bit out of it so that it's not part of the cooking process. So again, you just need to have a look and see as to what's going on. Likewise, again, with the celeriac, we have a skin to it. Leeks are very tender in the middle, but actually can be very fibrous on the outside. So again, it can be important for us to make sure that we peel away those outer edges, uh, those outer uh, leaves, in order to expose some of this very fine, tender, textured um, vegetable inside. 
So ultimately what we need to do is make sure that we use our eyes and our touches and our senses to make sure that we see those parts of the, of the fruit or the vegetables that are inappropriate and remove them either before we cook them or after we cook them in order to maintain the, the correct texture that's going to be safe. I know you're going to talk about those cooking techniques now. Yeah, so we've looked, we looked at various different cooking methods and there's all sorts of different ways of cooking, you know, cooking vegetables. Um, I think, you know, one of the key things, obviously, you know, is ensuring everything is going to be soft enough, particularly for a level six. That's got to be the one priority. Um, obviously, secondary to that, we're talking about nutrition, too. Um, so I think vibrancy is really, really important. And particularly around green vegetables, I would always look at, at quicker cooking methods. So boiling or steaming. Um, cooking things quite quickly and braising in their own juices quite quickly as well can also work to keep that nice vibrant cover color we've got some pea puree here which we had the peas we just um, boiled in some water for about three or four minutes and then we put them straight into a blender with some butter and we just uh, process them until they're really nice and smooth and you can see we've got a nice vibrant color um, to, to improve the texture on things like the peppers, you know, pepper's quite a, a fibrous vegetable, really. Um, and what we've done, we've, we've turned to some classical cooking methods and we've confied these peppers, which is cooking at a low temperature in oil. Um, before we even started, as Jane said, we peeled off this outer skin, so we've removed that. And then we've cooked them in some vegetable oil We've also got a little bit of white wine vinegar in here because the oil's quite rich. The white wine vinegar cuts through there. Um, some thyme and garlic, and we've cooked that in a really low oven, about 120 degrees for about 90 minutes to two hours. And you'll see the vegetables that we've got now are really, really soft. And it might be worth just getting a fork there, James, and just having a look at that consistency. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, Soft enough really to be broken down. down. Yeah, very easy. Lovely. Now, for the butternut squash, we've cooked this in a bag in the oven. So we, before we even cooked it, we cut the butternut squash to the right particle size. So we've got nice small 15 by 15 mil chunks. And then all we've done, we've cut that in a tinfoil bag. I've got a little bit of grease, grease proof paper inside, uh, a little thyme sprig, some garlic cloves, some salt and pepper. And then we've just cut that in the oven for, for about 45 minutes. Again, just to the, to it's a really nice tender vegetable. And again, you can see that from the fork pressure test that it just breaks down really, really easily. Does that maintain the nutrition as well? The it does, yeah. The, the thing is, what we try and avoid is to cook things in lots of water because all you're doing is, by cooking things in lots of water, a lot of that nutrition is escaping into the water. By cooking things in a small amount or keeping things in, in a bag like this, you're retraining all of that nutrition, all that goodness in there. And it's going to pack more of a punch in terms of flavour too. Um, some of the leeks, you know, Jane said about the, the, the fibrous, silver part of the leek, the outer leaves. Now what we've done here, we've cooked the leek um, in a, a little bit of water and some butter and we cooked it quite quickly just again so it's really softened down. Now leeks can still be quite stringy um, and it is also you know, worthwhile being mindful that yeah, if, if you're in any doubt at all, I would advise to puree them down because there'll be nothing wrong with pureeing that down to a level four puree consistency and serving it uh, in that form. So just something to be mindful of, not just the cooking temperature. You know, we're obviously doing those checks after the cooking to make sure it is actually suitable for that level two. I think sometimes when we talk about modifying uh, vegetables and the cooking processes, roasting is quite often overlooked and roasting is a great way of getting you know good flavour into foods, um, you know you get those nice caramelised flavours on there and so what we've done, we've taken the parsnip, 
We prepared it by skinning it and taking that fibrous core out the center. We've then roasted these in an oven. We've got some lovely color on there. Uh, but obviously when we roast things, it does dry things out. So as soon as these came out of the oven, what we did, we just put some, uh, we covered these just so essentially what they're doing, they're steaming. So um, they will steam and soften up, which will mean if we want to blend these down for an Idzi level four, it would, it would work, no problem at all. If we wanted to dice them for an Idzi level six, that would also work too. And the last thing we wanted to show you was some carrots. And again, we've, we've cooked these carrots quite quickly uh, in a little bit of uh, water and some butter and some sugar on the stove. Um, and we've just cooked them down. So again, you can see how nice and soft and tender they are. Uh, there you go. And all of the water that we cooked those in was absorbed back in to the carrots so that we've kept all the nutrition again, like with, like with the... Absolutely. I think you know, when it comes to you know, getting to the correct particle size, you have really two options. It's either, either a case of, of dicing it before cooking, like we did with the butternut squash, or potentially you know, cooking them whole, like we've done with the carrots, or like we've done with the, um, the, the pepper there, and then cutting them afterwards. So we are having those checks, obviously, before it goes onto the plate to make sure that it fits that particle size and the, the fork pressure test to make sure it's nice and tender enough. Okay, so for the final part of the webinar, we're going to look at our signature dish. So we're going to have a, a chicken fricassee with a, a lemon and fennel risotto, and we're going to serve that with a sweet corn. Uh, with sweet corn, I mean, the inspiration behind the dish is, is kind of the seasons we're in here. Uh, you know, coming into the autumn, we've got some lovely produce around us at the moment. So we wanted to bring it all together in one place, uh, one plate, and show you all the techniques that we've learned from the modules earlier on today. So to start off with, the main element of our dish is our, our chicken fricassee. Now, James is just going to prepare some of this while I talk you through the, the cooking method. Now, what we've used here, we've used some chicken thighs, so we're using the, the, the cuts that are well used. Um, we've sealed the meat off in a pan, just in some oil, and then we transferred it to a casserole dish. Um, we've got some onions that we sweated down, um, we reduced some white wine, and we've added some chicken stock to that, a little bit of cream, some thyme and some garlic, and we've braised the chicken in a really low oven um, for about 80 minutes at about 150 degrees. And you can see how nice and soft and tender yeah, it is. You can see that if I push that down, it just splits apart. Very this, soft. This is a great example of a dish that can be used for multiple textures, multiple easy levels. Um, so if you're in a large uh, care operation, you may have many different clients that want a range of different uh, textures. So you could, um, you could serve a whole chicken thigh and that would be suitable for a level seven. And then you can modify it down to the correct particle size for a level six or finer for a level five. Lovely. Excellent. The next part of our... I take this here. So we've got here, we've got some fennel that we've braised off whole. So we haven't taken any of the, the outer leaves out. As Preston was talking about earlier, they can be quite fibrous in here. So if I remove some of these and take them off, we le we're left really with the inside, the heart of it, the fennel, which is incredibly soft. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to drain that here. Obviously the outer sides can be pureed down and be turned into a, a fennel puree. Um, blended down and then with butter added can give a very, very delicious texture. So now I've got the, the fennel that's very soft, which I'll show you in a moment. Take that stem out and then cut up into the various sizes that we want. We've got a bowl for that to go. Lovely. That we'll go get in? your bowl. Thank you. <coughs> we'll just take our level. So we just take our level six here, and then I'll chop the others more finely for a level five. Okay. There we go. And as you can see again with this, if I just if I just push down, it's very very soft, without any 
fibrous bits. So I'm just going to chop this one down. Just chopping after we've cooked it to make sure that it's the right consistency. Do you have a fork there? Really, really soft that is, isn't it? Yeah. Great. Do you have a fork so I can just check yep. the consistency of that? Thank you very much. So if I move it around, I can see that my fork goes in between there, between the bits go between the fork prongs to make sure that they are the correct consistency. Okay, so if I pop that into there, we'll just bind that and test it in a moment. Now for the, the risotto element of the dish, what we've done, we've used short grain rice based on our findings earlier on. Um, and we've taken 150 grams of, of pudding rice and then we've cooked it in a risotto style um, by adding 750 millilitres of uh, stock. Um, because we want to complement the flavour profile of the dish, we've taken some of the fennel stock that the fennel was cooked in, add some really nice flavour to that, and we've just cooked it out really over quite a low heat until it's really nice and soft and tender. Now, pudding rice is short enough where it's going to be suitable for a level six and also for a level five. Uh, obviously, when we, um, when we start talking about a level four pureed, we would need to actually uh, process that until it's a nice smooth puree. Um, because of the, stacky, uh, the, the sticky tacky texture of um, the rice, what we've actually done is added some sweet corn puree and some fennel puree to that, which one um, improves the flavour and it just lightens that texture and makes sure it's suitable for a level four pureed. For the sweet corn, um, what we've done for the sweet corn, this is only suitable for a level seven because of the outer husks. It can be quite fibrous. So we've actually made a sweet corn puree by taking 250 grams of sweet corn and we've sweated that down in a pan with some onion and some butter um, and 150 milliliters of it's chicken stock. So it's really nice and soft. And then we've processed that in a blender. And then we've got the pepper. And what we have here, as we showed you before, we had uh, the confit pepper that we've taken the skins off and we've taken the seeds out and we find ourselves with the, with the texture that we showed you earlier. So that would go down with the fork. We have it for level seven, as you can see, nice and big. Then we have it cut down for level six, soft and bite size. Yeah. And then here we've cut it finer still to that four mil so that it is and bound with a puree uh, of red pepper. And if I show you there, it comes off in one cohesive uh, flick. It's a great color on there as well, isn't it? Yes. Lovely. Okay, so are they our elements? And the last element on there is the, the butternut squash. Now we showed this earlier, so this has been cooked uh, on papillot, so in a paper bag or in a foil bag here. Uh, it's been cut up to the correct, uh, the correct size already for, uh, for soft and bite size, level six, into level six, and it's been cooked until very tender, very soft, and we showed you how soft that was earlier. So it's got all the flavor of thyme, all the flavor of garlic in there as well, and all the nutrition. Okay? Okay, so we're gonna have a little look at the, uh, the presentation. Uh, we're gonna start off with a, a level seven, and then we're gonna work our way down to a level six, a level five, and a level four. Some elements of the dish will be consistent across all four, to, um, if they're suitable for it, and there will be some modification, but we're gonna talk through that as we start plating up. So we're gonna start off with some purees. So James has got a, a pepper puree, the which we're gonna use to garnish the plate, really intense flavors. Just a small amount on there just to give that hit, vibrant hit of red pepper flavour in the dish. And then I'm just following James with a sweet corn puree. So the sweet corn on the pepper puree is consistent across all of them. And then we have got pieces of pepper as well, which we're gonna add on. And we build it up. As we build up. So just a little bit of... So we need a little bit of lemon in there. Oh. Just to finish it off. And we've got our fennel that's gone through there as well. Mm -hmm. I'm popping that just a small amount. So. There. 
Okay. Okay, the risotto then for a level six. So we've got our fennel there, which is diced to a 15 by 15 millimeter piece. But for level five, we have the, the four mil pieces of fennel through here and the sweet corn puree as well. Okay. There you go. And then finally for a level four, we fully pureed the rice and we've mixed it with sweet corn and fennel puree. Lovely. And as you can see, this, the portion of that is smaller, probably by half there, maybe a third, uh, because it is more dense uh, in the amount of nutrients in there. Okay. Thank you, Dave. So we'll have a little look at a piece of chicken. Obviously for a level seven, there's no particle restrictions. So we've got a whole chicken thigh that we're putting on the top of there. <coughs> And then chicken for a level six has been diced down. As we showed you earlier. Uh, chicken for a level five, we've diced down as we did earlier, but we've mixed it with some of that, uh, that sauce and some of, that, uh, and some of the, the meat puree that we've made as well. But that gives it that real saucy flavor too. So that combines both. Okay. Yeah. And then for our fully pureed version. Which was just blended down for a longer period of time, because obviously all those, those meat, uh, uh, meat proteins need to be blended into a fine, fine puree. So, right, so here we have some red pepper, which is soft, but equally these ones are longer and wouldn't be suitable for a level, it out, for any other level. So it needs to go on to our main, Level seven. We've got some pieces of butternut squash there as well, which are also suitable for level six. They're unsuitable for level five, so I have my butternut squash cut to four mil and, and stirred in with some butternut squash puree. So again, if I just take some little bits. One. So that it looks the same. So, lovely. And finally, the puree for the button squash on here. Like so. Okay. So, what else have we got in there? Our sauce. And then we've got our, our sauce. So we've got our, our thick sauce here for a level six. Our normal sauce that we have here for a level seven. Just nap it over there. And there the sauce, go. as we said, was in already in here, and then the sauce is also in with the with the blended one there. So there they are. There you go, you've got our um, our chicken fricassee with a lemon and fennel risotto. Um, we really love this dish, it's great flavours and you know, we really hope you enjoy it too. Thank you for watching. Uh, we hope that you've uh, taken on some of the things that we've been going through and that they've been relevant to some of the, the, the issues you may have been finding around IDSI uh, food, the levels around IDSI food. Um, you can visit our website on, at www.oakhouse-kitchen.com where we have uh, plenty of things that we'll be putting up, plenty of blogs, recipes, and other findings that we will be, uh, will be coming across. Thanks for watching. Yeah, no, if anyone's got any questions, please answer now. We'll be happy to answer them. Uh, but hopefully we'll see you soon.